Alright, good evening everyone. Welcome this meeting is being recorded. Oh, you all have to uh, accept that. Um, welcome to the uh, August meeting of the Narvith Planning Commission. I'm going to ask everyone here, uh, when you're speaking, to use your theater voices, shall we say, and um, just get in the habit of um, saying who you are when you're speaking, um, in case anyone else who's watching wants to know who's speaking. So I'm Todd Bressy, I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. Welcome, everybody. Um, tonight's agenda um, is um, um, uh, we have a number of uh, items, subdivision and land development items. We will start with announcements and updates. We have a uh, review of the preliminary plan for 32 Sabine Avenue, the review of the final plan for 230 Dudley Avenue. Uh, then we move on to old business, which is further discussion of infill housing and accessory dwelling unit uh, zoning amendments. And then uh, we will save time for new business, which is a discussion of multimodal, multimodal improvements uh, from Wynwood Road. And then we will have public comment. So that's our uh, agenda. Um, I'll begin with uh, my update, which is that um, um, in case you uh, weren't watching, the borough council voted by the two to uh, Approve the historic district ordinance. Um, in all seriousness, if you are into this kind of thing, I suggest you watch the comments each borough council member made when they explain their vote. It's like a little bit of civics in action, I think, and it's well worth the half hour of your time to hear what each council member had to say, either voting for or against the um, the district. Um, we, uh, Chloe. Uh, and Kathleen have been working on um, finalizing the application uh, to um, PHMC, which is due on August 6th. And Chloe, when we get to MCPC update, perhaps you can update us on that. Um, so thanks, everyone. That was uh, a heavy lift. I'm, I'm, I'm a heavy lift. I'm still kind of <laughs> recovering from that. But thanks, everyone, for your, your help in getting us to this point. Um, there are two other development applications I'd like to report on, 146 Marion, 3 Elmwood. 146 Marion was to be on our agenda tonight, but the applicant has requested uh, an extension of time for our consideration. Um, there are a few details about this mission they would like to finalize, uh, particularly some of the things that the Planning Commission requested that it would like to see. Um, so I believe that will be granted. And then 3 Elmwood, um, uh, after we voted uh, not to recommend the approval of that, the applicant uh, requested an extension of time for consideration of that application. And council did uh, grant that extension of time. And I believe uh, Lower Marion Township uh, did the same thing. We granted an extension of time. So that, that application is still in process. Um, and I will let you know what I hear going forward. So those are both something, things we will probably uh, hear about in September. Um, I don't have any other updates, so I'll ask uh, Chloe, uh, would you like to update us on the submission of the historic district uh, materials to the state and, and the um, update of the saldo and any other updates you'd like to provide? Yes, thank you, Todd. I'm Chloe Moore with the Montgomery County Planning Commission and uh, Mike Nakowicz also with MCPC here. Um, congratulations to Narberth on the adoption of the historic district. It's a really wonderful and momentous thing. There's a couple of follow-up items. Because it's a historic district, there's a process by which that gets certified by the state. Um, there's a number of materials that need to be submitted. I've been working with Kathleen from the Lower Rank Conservancy, as well as your own Dave Brower, has been helping still with putting materials together. The deadline for submission to the state is on Friday, and there are a couple of loose ends that do need to be followed up with the council as well. Some of the materials that are being submitted to the state just need to be approved by council. It's um, the list of properties and structures, buildings, and whether each one is contributing or not contributing. So we're still um, going 
going through that and making sure that's final and perfect. Um, and then uh, once that's be submitted to the state this weekend or to the council hopefully later this month. And the council also needs to just officially give their thumbs up to the narrative descriptions that accompany the submission to the state. So just working, um, working on those materials as well as uh, finalizing whatever needs to go to council and make sure they have what they need to provide appropriate approval. Um, our colleague, Erin Holly, is continuing to work with your borough engineer and your borough zoning officer, both of whom are here in this meeting. On the south, though, he estimates that um, there'll be a draft of the design section, which is, from the planning commission's perspective, maybe the most significant portion of the saldo um, available for review within a couple of months, and then the entire entire saldo hopefully early next year. Um, I don't know, Eric or Kevin, if you would like to add. I apologize, clearly. Um, for those that are remote, can you hear her clearly? Eric, okay. you I think Eric and, and Michelle are the only No, I'm having a hard time. Hey, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, yeah. You've been in and out. I apologize. I'm sorry about that. I appreciate you letting me know. Um, so I... Just very briefly, I've been continuing to put together the materials for the historic district submission to the state. And then about the saldo, um, uh, Aaron Holly was, thinks that within the next couple of months, there'll be a draft of the design section available for review by the planning commission. Eric's nodding, so that's a good sign. And then the entire saldo, hopefully early in, in the new year. You want to add to that, Eric or Kevin? Please feel free. Feel free. No, no, I think that sounds about right. Uh, last time we met, uh, we were working through some details, and he was going to go back and look into some more stuff. So that sounds accurate. And then finally, our colleague Matt Popak from our transportation planning section is going to present to uh, at the the second council meeting in August about the parking recommendations related to parking from your parking task force. Mm -hmm. Is that it from us? As far as I know, yes. Okay, there is the MCPC update. I apologize if any of you could not hear that. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, I neglected to mention when we started, there are six planning commissioners here. Um, all commissioners are present except Jim Cornwell, who uh, requested to be requested to be excused because of their prior conflict. So, um, six planning commissioners, the borough zoning officer, borough engineer, and um, the uh, assistant borough manager are with us today. Okay, so we will begin with our uh, subdivision and land development review, and I think we should probably start with 32 Sabine, if we could. And I'll welcome those uh, folks who are here tonight uh, to discuss this um, application. Um, if you could focus on the things you've done to respond to the prior comments and the things that you've modified since we last saw, uh, that would be the, the best thing for us if you could do that. So thank you. Is this a good place for this? It's okay with us. Is it okay with you, Barbara? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, welcome. My name is Chris Young. I'm the civil engineer for the project. The owner and applicant are here tonight as well. So this is the 32 Sabine project. Right now we're in the preliminary plan stage in Narberth uh, for a land development project, which, which this is. There's tentative, sketch, preliminary, and final. And so we're in that middle stage of preliminary where we provide the fully engineered plans. So we presented this plan in uh, early May to the planning commission. Planning Commission had a handful of comments that you requested we address and then come back. Um, we weren't able to get on the June agenda uh, and late July, I think we had submitted some facade information that uh, the 
a zoning officer reviewed and, and found uh, an issue that he wanted us to address. So really the changes since the May meeting haven't really been anything to the plan. The plan essentially looks the same as the way that it was before. The five kind of call them major changes that we had was uh, we hadn't been to the Shade Tree Commission yet in early May, and so we did go to the Shade Tree Commission in, on May 11th. We uh, heard their concerns, they provided a review letter, and so we will comply with their recommendations. There were a handful of stormwater management uh, comments in the review letter. We tried to address them. I think there's one remainder that we didn't yet, but that's a will comply item. Uh, the facade area was a big question. Just for those who aren't aware, the code used to have a table with facade area information, minimum area for each district. That was, uh, that table was repealed. And so now applicants need to get the information on their own. Uh, we were able to get some information from the borough uh, for all of the other homes along Sabine Avenue on this side of the street on this block. Uh, there were some that were missing information, which I think was the reason the, that ordinance was repealed, is it, it wasn't complete. And so we did send a survey crew out to get additional information for those houses. We submitted that to the zoning officer for, for review. He identified one of the buildings uh, as really being a multifamily. It, it appears as a twin building, and so we had counted it, but in reality, there were two units on each side of the twin, which really turned it into a multifamily. Uh, and so that had to be excluded from the calculations. Uh, so we, that's another, it's a will do item. We did that. Our, uh, Architect did revise the plans, and I have the revised architectural plan that I can show you tonight. We did submit it about a week ago, just so you could get some an advanced view of it. But this is the architectural view. This is the, the front of the building. And here's the facade area calculation. And before we, you could see more of the third floor, but then as a result of taking out one of those buildings and the requirement was reduced, now that part of the uh, floor, you just see the roof. So uh, the, the next item had to do was, again, with trees. It had to do with some uh, existing trees that were to be removed. Uh, Planning Commission was looking for some more information on them and their health. We did submit a report from the applicant's uh, arborist, and we sent that report to the Shade Tree Commission as well. So they had that when they reviewed the plans. Uh, and then lastly was the access to this property is through, this is the existing conditions plan uh, that shows the existing home and drive, portion of driveway to be removed with a red cross hatch. There's an existing easement that goes straight along at the rear of these other properties that front Sabine Avenue, but the driveway curves. And so we had sent the survey crew out there to pick up the exact location of the driveway. Previously, we were just showing it from some GIS aerial information, but now this is the accurate location. We showed this revised easement in red. We did forward it to the neighbor to try to, which previously he said he was receptive to uh, revising the easement, uh, but we needed to survey that, so we did send that to him. We are still working with him to get, you know, the finalized documents on that revised easement. Uh, and so those are really the highlights from where we were in May. Uh, we do have review letters from Yerkes, uh, from Montgomery County Planning Commission, and Pannoni, and essentially all of those are will comply items. I'm happy to go over them, any of them if you'd like, but I, I know you typically like to uh, hear from from the individuals first. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I would like to ask if uh, I'll, I'll ask our engineer and zoning officer if there are any comments that you would like to call to our attention tonight. Uh, Eric, are there any comments from your letter that you would like to call, call to our attention tonight? Um, 
No, I, Chris uh, laid it out pretty well. Uh, the gist of the comments is during, by the time we get the final plan, they'll have to iron out the, the details on that driveway easement. Uh, there is a handful, there's a stormwater comment. They will, uh, I'm sure we'll address that without issue. Uh, and then as far as uh, the, the tree, so as, as Chris was saying, uh, they documented that that one tree is uh, dying uh, from an arborist. And then they also, based on the recommendations from the Shade Tree Commission, have come up with a, like a uniform street tree uh, pattern along the front and then trees along uh, the property lines. Um, so it, it, it's looking to comply, uh, but maybe if you have any uh, feedback on that, uh, that's really the, the, the main comment in my letter that you could have input on if you so choose. Uh, Eric um, and Chris, could you discuss comment four about the parking space dimensions and the uh, columns of the decks? which are near or in the parking spaces? Right, Eric, so, can you, can you? yeah, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just state on it and then uh, Chris can, can speak to it. So each of the units requires two off-street parking spaces. They have the garage and they have the parking spaces uh, underneath the deck. Uh, it's one of like the semantics. Uh, most parking spaces, as we know, are nine by, foot by 18 feet. Uh, however, there's that lot, the section of the code that calls a parking space uh, 10 by 20. So if you're going by those dimensions, the uh, the parking spaces dimensioned on the plan under the deck uh, have the post uh, to the deck uh, within their footprint. Uh, however, they don't really need that space to comply uh, with the parking requirement. Um, so I just brought it up as maybe something you know, design consideration uh, for the applicant. one spot per unit district. All right. It's a 3A or 3B? It's just 3B. They just need one spot per unit. Is that right? Oh, okay, so, okay, well, in that case, then they're even better. They have the garage and they have space under the deck for parking. So, in essence, the area of the deck does not need to count as a parking space. For, com for compliance with the code. For comply with the code. Okay. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add? Oh, you're hiding. <laughs> Just looking for Chris. I didn't find him. Do you have anything to add? No. Uh, Mr. Spears is correct. It is. It is three B, and so it looks like what's required is one. I think we were sh we labeled in the chart that we had to. I think if we just change that to one, it'll solve it. Uh, but we also will discuss whether it's worth adjusting those columns to make sure that there is enough room for uh, two code compliance spaces should we need that. It's a will comply either way. Okay. Um, Eric, anything else? No, uh, everything else in the letter is just uh, procedural that will be uh, taken care of. Okay. Kevin, is there anything in your review letter that you would like to call to our attention tonight? Well, um, my July 26th letter brought to the attention, um, as Chris stated earlier, uh, the removal of the twin or multifamily structure at 3436 Sabine Avenue. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to review the revisions um, after it was issued. But assuming you can stay under 644 square feet for the front facade, we should be good. Um, I would like to also keep in mind that sometimes reducing the front facade area will also reduce the um, frontage build out. So please just keep that in mind. I haven't seen the changes, but sometimes reducing the frontage area also um, reduces that number. And we need to keep that in mind. Kevin, did you receive those changes? Uh, Michelle, I believe Michelle sent them to me on Friday, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Mike, do you have any comments that you would like to call to our attention? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And again, I'm going to turn it on. Don't on the other one. She's at the top left. I see it. Thank you. <laughs> and again, I'm Mike Narkowitz from MCPC. Sorry for the uh, noise disturbance. Um, in 
my review letter. Um, I also address the easement, and I guess the only thing I'd add is that if the easement needs to be modified, that it should be recorded on the final plan. Um, a couple comments, well, um, short comments about street trees. Um, the species of existing trees should be shown on the plan, um, and the trees, the street trees are required to be planted at least eight feet back from the sidewalk. It looks like they're just planted about five feet back. Um, let's see here. And otherwise, um, I just have a note about um, showing steep slopes if they are on the plan. Um, and other information required by the landscaping plan, um, such as existing mature trees to be removed. Um, and a landscape schedule is also required of the landscaping plan. So that's, those were all my comments. Okay. Um, Chris, do you have any concern about the, Mike's comment about the location of the trees? No. Is that something that you can, you can accommodate? I know there was some note in the letter about underground lines and utility lines. Now that the uh, underground lines are more of an issue uh, parallel with the street, but not moving away from the street. Okay. okay. Uh, Mike, I, um, I have to confess, I tried to read, and Eric, I, I tried to read the street tree comments. <laughs> And, and, and kind of filter that through the landscape ordinance and the zoning. Are both of you satisfied that, that the comments of the Street Tree Commission and those codes are being followed accurately? I have a hard time sorting it out myself. Uh, yes, you're, you're asking about the Shade Tree Committee's letter? Well, I'm, I'm asking, do you, are you satisfied that the landscaping plan that's been provided complies with mm -hmm. the codes and with the street tree? Yes. Like, yes. Okay. I mean, there's... I have trouble figuring out. Yes, there's just a couple additional pieces of information, and, and as you just asked the applicant, you know, and had the applicant respond, in the affirmative, um, they're addressing the, the issue about the tree setback from the sidewalk. So, yes, I'm satisfied. Okay. And Eric, you're, you're satisfied, too? Cause yeah, they're creating a, a uniform uh, street tree frontage, uh, and then they also have other landscaping throughout the property uh, that would accommodate uh, tree removal. Okay, thank you all. Are there any planning commission questions? Mm -hmm. Any questions from the planning commission members? I do have one question. Um, um, the each dwelling has has garages with two parking spots in, on the back side, is that correct? So if, if you have those spots and those allow you to satisfy uh, the parking requirement, in fact, well, anyway, they allow you to satisfy the parking requirement, why do you draw, show on your drawings the, the driveway area having parking spaces as well? In essence, four spaces per unit. Why, why is it indicated that way? It's not necessary for that to be a parking space to you. To be honest, I don't recall. <laughs> um, <laughs> is it perhaps because you are allowing the possibility of garage to be converted to have a full space? I think if you look back in the, in the original discussion, I believe we were asked to make that space larger. Okay. Um, because of uh, get, yeah, getting around, turning around right. radius, you know, turning radiuses, right. and so cars want to get parked in. Right. You know, I, I was just curious. I understand that part because I remember we were concerned about how cars could maneuver sure. around there. I was just curious why they were marked as parking spaces. Uh, so, I, I don't have the answer to that. And um, it, it, it occurred to me maybe you were thinking that would give the owner the flexibility to turn the garage into having the space. So, yes. so in which case, that it would be important for those spots in the back to function properly in case they ever were the parking spaces that were uh, needed. Um, and so I guess it would be important for, uh, you know, I was trying to look on the drawings and, and personally I couldn't find where the columns were drawn. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I'm just, 
not looking properly. But can you point to the sheet and to the area where the columns are shown? So we can I don't think the columns are shown on the site plan. They're shown on the architectural rendering in the back. Yeah, which I don't have So does that mean then that, okay, so the garage doors then are a little less than 18 feet wide, is that right? 16. 16, okay. And so it's a two bay garage, each bay is eight feet wide, and the columns are, are 18 feet apart. Um, so if we, so, if these were to be the parking spaces, would, if that were the case, would you then have to, often we, we see waivers requested for spaces that are smaller than allowed, but you wouldn't be allowed to do that for all your spots, right? Right, so. Only, I believe it's 30% are allowed to be right. done in that way. Right, so if you only have two spots necessary, that's crap, right? Do they get on street credit through this area? So, what's the weird thing about these properties? That each of them is like a quarter inch short uh -huh. of being able to claim a street parking spot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. wow. so, I'm concerned is like if a resident wants to turn the garage like into a rec room or something, they don't get pinched on the zone on the parking, right? Because they have to have a 10 by 20 spot. But I think if they just that, they'll be okay, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean. Shouldn't they be able to like apply for like a, you know, they're so close to being able to claim for street parking. I, I can't presumptively say they can apply for something like that and that will solve the problem. I, I, I just, I'm thinking that, you know, they have kids, they want another bedroom, whatever, they want to convert it, they should be able to park legally. But it sounds like if they only need one spot per unit, mm -hmm. then there's plenty of room for the have for them to have one car per unit. And if they want to park more than one car per unit, that's there. Does everyone? Yeah. Does anyone else have a concern about that? Does it seem like it would work out? We just don't want to build someone into something that would be a problem later. Take away their flexibility. Like, what if you came in and said, I want to convert my garage, and someone said, you can't do that because you don't have a parking spot. Well, that's, that's like what we want to avoid, right? We want people to be able to make those changes. Yeah, we do. <laughs> well, because that's the idea is to let houses change for people. OK, all right. I don't think that's an issue. Any other questions or comments? I have a comment. I have a comment. Yes. Just in, in the vein of the uh, thinking about the future residents of the structure, uh, the only egress that's not the front door is the garage door, as I think, in the elevations. There's a front door and there's a garage door. No side door and there's no rear door. So if you had a way to put I mean, it might be a little tricky with the small lots, but if you had a way to put stairs off of the rear deck, and if, assuming that's the dining room or the kitchen or whatever it is in the architectural plan, I, I know the residents are likely to appreciate being able to walk down to the, to the space without having to go through the garage. Um, and I think to your, to your point, Todd, about the rear of the property, uh, you know, besides being used to wash your car, you know, it's, it is uh, people, the kids might be back there, you know, people might be hanging out back there outside, especially right now, right, with the COVID restrictions and so on. So if you could work stairs in and a rear or some kind of egress that's not the garage door, I just think that would be better than the status quo. Is that possible to consider that? We could certainly consider it. I don't, just right now, I'm not sure if it's possible. Uh, whether or not it would have to be within the side yard setback, and so whether or not we'd have room. Uh, and I also don't want to comment because I'm not the architect, and so it, fair enough. Can, I, but, can a staircase like that be in the side yard? Uh, that? Well, I'm just looking at the plan here. It looks like they've got room based on where they draw the side yard setback. So, it's just something to think about. It's like that back for It's not a compliance issue. It's Okay, if there are no other comments, then um, what we would normally do at this point is entertain a resolution to council about whether we recommend approval of this, and if so, any conditions. Would anyone like to make a, uh, 
Make a motion. Mr. Mayor, what's your motion? I will move that we, I don't think there are any conditions for considering for this, is that correct? Well, I think the conditions would be to comply with the, uh, as, as Mr. Young said, to comply with the comments made by the um, Borough Engineer of the Borough uh, Zoning Officer in Montgomery County Planning Commission. Okay, then uh, I, I move that we approve the sketch with those, with those conditions. Mm -hmm. Plan, right? this is a yeah. I would add um, also contingent on the zoning officer's uh, certification that the, the, the facade and frontage issues have been resolved properly. But I think that is an administrative thing. He just needs to check those uh, drawings, right, Kevin? Kevin? Yeah, I agree. Any other? Okay, so all in favor? Any, first of all, any comments from your team before we, any issues with that? Okay, uh, all in favor um, of June's resolution as amended by me? All right. Aye. Okay. Since this is the Olympics, I'll just note, you've set the Narberth Planning Commission world record for an agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the most? The fastest. <laughs> so let's talk about the Dirty Dudley. That's next. This is a subdivision. Final subdivision review. So. Good evening. I just want you to know we're going to try to break the world record right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, 230 Dudley Avenue. This is a one lot subdivision with an existing home uh, and there's a vacant parcel on the side that we are just subdividing off that vacant parcel. We were before the planning commission uh, in the preliminary plan stage. This plan does not require the tentative sketch so we could go from preliminary to final. So we are now in final. Uh, this is the first time we're presenting to you. We do have review letters, but they are also will comply. They're very short and I'm not sure uh, worth me going over right now. There haven't really been any significant plan changes since ultimately all that's proposed at this time is really the property line and the uh, concrete monuments and pins to make that line official. We did uh, present this plan to the Narberth Shade Tree Commission as well because I know there was con some concern about providing uh, street trees and so we did present to them and show them street trees and they sent us uh, their approval slash review letter. And so uh, this is another will comply. We think this is pretty straightforward. Uh, although I don't believe we need to show the proposed or at this time we're not proposing any new uh, building. However, uh, we have an idea of what it might be. Uh, we're not ready to move into that stage yet until we get through final plans. Uh, plans get recorded, escrow gets posted, deeds get uh, recorded at the county, and so we're kind of months away from actually having a lot to submit a permit for. However, uh, this is what we had in mind. Uh, we do have the zoning chart there. This is the same plan that we presented uh, during the uh, preliminary plan stage, but I wanted to show it again because it's, it's kind of alluded to in the, in the zoning officer's review letter. Uh, and so we can make that part of the set uh, if that... I think that will address that comment. But I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so what you're showing us now is, uh, it, that is the, um, the potential uh, way you might build on this new lot. It's the potential, we didn't, it's not engineered with grading or stormwater or road controls or anything like that, uh, but it, it was put in there to show compliance with zoning, uh, or at least site plan zoning, not the architectural portion, uh, just so you have a feel for what it might look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that garage? Is that garage in the, in the rear yard step Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, it'll meet the accessory dwelling unit requirements, so it's only three feet from the rear setback and the side. 
So it's, it's in the third lot layer, which is one of the permitted locations for a garage. And you could put the garage in the rear yard setback like that? Yes. Wow, I've got to go back and read the code. Okay. It's a utility building. Yeah, I know. Okay, all right. Yeah, accessory. Okay. accessory building has a different setback. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, I'll ask Eric and Kevin. Kevin, do you have any uh, comments from your letter that you would like to bring to our attention? No, I don't. I'll keep it short. Um, other than my letter generally states that just the new development of the new construction of the proposed lot just needs to be by right. That's about it for me. Okay. Uh, Eric, is there anything in your letter that you'd like to call to our attention? Uh, the only uh, comment I have of substance uh, is a request uh, that the applicant place a note on the plan uh, just confirming that those uh, the items noted for demolition would be uh, the demolition would take place expeditiously uh, after the recording of the plan uh, so that we end up the, so that it's removed and then we have uh, all of our compliance setbacks and impervious coverages as shown on the plan. Eric, were there, I, I was trying to recall, were there any outstanding stormwater issues from the last uh, approval from the preliminary? Uh, so at this point, there would be no stormwater because there's no proposed development. They're just removing uh, objects on the property. Okay. But um, uh, I believe the amount of disturbance that is likely to occur would, re or would require a storm ma stormwater management solution. They uh, are under 5,000 square feet of disturbance. So if you, it's five, no, so if you are disturbing under 5,000 square feet of soil, you meet the exemption of stormwater management. Is that true in this watershed or is that, a, I thought when we discussed this last time, we concluded that they would have to provide a stormwater management Solution. When they develop the lot eventually with a new development, they will be required to install stormwater management at that point. Yes. And that will have to comply with the code. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Eric. I think we were just. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so I do have a question for Eric and Kevin about both of you flagged the, um, um, the section of, of, of the saldo, uh, which requires uh, um, subdivision plan shall furthermore show in detail the proposed development of each parcel of, of ground, um, show in detail. And I'm wondering, is what the applicant has submitted or is proposing you attach, does that satisfy from your point of view that provision of the subdivision code that they, that they demonstrate in detail? Uh, what the uh, uh, development on that lot would be like? So I believe uh, a combination of two things. One is the uh, partly what the applicant is showing that they would uh, potentially develop the plan, um, you know, in, in the future, uh, you know, with a compliant structure. Uh, but then also with the removal of the existing structure, I believe we talked about it uh, at the during the preliminary plan. Uh, that the section of the building they're removing uh, is functionally an addition uh, and that they're re once that's removed, uh, you end, the house is being returned to it, it's the, the stone facade and, and blending in with the, uh, with the neighborhood. Um, so based off of what was presented, uh, you know, as part of their application and their presentation to the planning commission uh, last month, I, we felt uh, pretty comfortable that uh, the new lot is going to be a house that blends with the community um, and that, you know, that the basis, the portion of this application is just the subdivision uh, and the modification of that house. Any future development on the house of the property will have to comply uh, with all applicable zoning requirements. That's true, but the, the, the code provision you cited says the subdivision plan shall show in detail the proposed development of each parcel of ground. So does this satisfy that? showing in detail the proposed development. So I, there, there, this is uh, the, 
the application that we have now is for the subdivision. Um, if the question is, do we want them to present the like a theoretical plan that they're you know, showing there, uh, include that as part of the application, that would if that would document it uh, in writing you know, as a drawing, uh, as a, a yeah. theoretical a theoretical uh, satisfying uh, of all the applicable codes. Um, you know, um, I, mean, I, 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 I believe it, they're creating a compliant lot um, that can be, official, can be compliantly built on. Yes, uh, we are comfortable with that uh, understanding. What's your take on that Saldo provision? Do you feel like this submission addresses that Saldo provision? Yeah, I agree with the fact that um, expeditiously solving and removing the portions to complete the compliant lot in which the existing house um, exists is, is the more important part that we're looking for now. Um, and then we'll just move forward with a buy right project moving forward. Legally, I would assume that we could um, reject anything that was not compliant or buy right on the proposed lot moving forward. But we're comfortable looking at it from a compliant lot size, setback, things like that. Um, and that's why my, my comment, specifically number two, make sure that the existing building, um, if it's part of the subdivision, is compliant in terms of setbacks. So we want them to remove those portions of the building that aren't compliant to make that a compliant lot now. And then obviously we'll check to make sure it's a buy right project moving forward. Um, any other planning commission questions? Or comments? Questions we have to okay. The only question, uh, when do you yet know what um, building type uh, you will uh, build here? Would it be a detached house, a multifamily house? Right now the expectation is to be a single family house. So this is the last chance we have to look at the subdivision since it's a final plan. So um, if there are no other questions or comments, any other comments or from you? I'm going to just ask for our resolution to make a recommendation to council. So we can make a re uh, recommendation. I did the last one. <laughs> And make a recommendation, you're going to ruin the, the bid for two records in one night. Oh, sure. Um, I recommend that we um, approve the subdivision as submitted for the um, final plan for 234. Okay. Um, uh,
accessory dwelling unit amendments and have come up with some kind of policy statements you'd like to put on the table. And then we we'll summarize. Yeah, okay. Could you print that out? I thought I printed it out, but I wanted to see where did I put it this time. Well, I can just read it. Yeah. 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 I thought I printed it, but I probably did, and it's probably upstairs. Okay. 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 What is the idea that you guys would like to put on the table for discussion? that we basically went through your list to discuss ADUs. And there are a number of standards for accessory dwelling units um, in places like California where they are quite common. And um, it seemed to, you know, one of the questions was what size would we consider to be an ADU? And in, we kind of landed on a maximum of 800 square feet. It seems to be somewhere between 400 and 1,000 in, in many places, um, depending on where you are, but 800 seem like a reasonable number of amount of square feet for um, a one and a half story structure. So the when we say one and a half, that would mean that the roof would be pitched at the second floor line and there would be a half a story of living space above the first floor. So is that square footage gross or is that the footprint? That's floor. Well, we say livable area, so it's net, I guess. But I would say floor. I mean, it, it could be floor. I mean, if you wanted, we didn't, we weren't that specific. What was the area? 800 square feet. You know, one and a half story structure. So one, one thing to add to the mix is one of the things we learned about this when we looked at 650 Montgomery is the building code allows for like a mezzanine inside, which um, doesn't count as a story, like for the purposes of Kent member, we went through that conversation. So like if you said one and a half stories, that's, that's an expression of, I think, just the height. But inside you could have the, the ground and you could have that mezzanine or that loft. Yeah, I mean, I think it has more to do with the shape of the building mm -hmm. because one and a half stories implies that there is a pitched roof with partial living space in it. Right. And because the maximum height is 16 feet to the mid midline of the pitch, um, you really, you could get a one story structure with mezzanine or a one and a half story structure with a staircase leading up to a second floor that's enclosed. Right, right which is smaller than the first floor. It's right. a habitable attic. Yeah, basically. It's a gear. We also did note that the utility building it can have a gambrel roof, and it can have dormers, so it can have a substantial second story. You know? But it still has that 16 foot yeah. height limit. Yeah. So you're not going to get up to a 35 foot. Uh, 16 to the midpoint of the roof, you're saying? To the, the average, area. how is it described? From the peak over to the peak the eaves. to the eaves. So if it's a gambrel, I guess it would still be somewhere in there. Somewhere yeah, in there. Just so the gambrel, guess a gambrel pushes out the volume. Yeah. It gambrel just gives you more volume. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. You don't knock your head as much. My only question would be about these things is since we have a form-based code, the total amount of square footage in a structure isn't normally something we yeah. measure. 
we would measure like a building footprint, right? right? And building height, but to get a volume, that's a form. Yeah. The total square footage. Yeah. This is different. Yeah. This is different simply to limit capacity. And I think we need to start doing that. If we talk about, well, the same will come up when we talk about cottage, small scale housing too, which I think we also need to consider floor space, <coughs> having a floor space cap. If we ever get to that point of you know, considering cottage housing. Mm -hmm. You're not able to just come up with like a maximum footprint? That would, in essence. I don't think, I mean, well, I think. I mean, I guess. Go ahead. Right, go ahead. Well, part of this is also it, 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 the question is also adaptive for use of existing structures. So as long as they're compliant, I guess it's fine. I mean, that is an interesting question, though, because when you think about 800 square foot one-story building, it's quite a bit larger. Mm -hmm. 2040. There's still yeah. like a house on Dudley Avenue. They're, mm -hmm. they're still going to be subject to their coverage limits on their yeah. lot. You know, the building coverage limits. I mean, there are garages that size. Yeah. Though, but I just wonder, a two-car garage, basically. You know, to be consistent with the language of the code, of the existing code, which deals with lot coverage and not net or gross square footage within the building, whether we need to try to translate what what that square footage comes up to to a maximum footprint. Yeah, we should look at that. It seems like we should be able to do that. Yeah, and that would be mathematical limitations, what you could do. Have you ever run into that, Chloe? Any discussions of ADUs and where the square footage comes from and, or how it's decided? Um, you know, I asked around a tiny bit after the last meeting what's going on with ADUs around the county. I only worked with one other community on an ADU ordinance and they were just bent on prohibiting them no matter what. It was a very different conversation. Um, but it appears that there's still a lot of sort of fear about having having these extra units and having them turn into rental units. And there's nowhere in Montgomery County that allows ADUs to be rented to just anyone. They're all restricted to, where they are allowed, they're restricted to family members. So I think the um, the size limitations, square footage limitations, come you know, come from sort of fear of, of what this could mean or what this could become, rather than some practical concern they're trying to address. That's my impression. Um, there is a model ADU ordinance that was put together by AARP and the APA um, that I have not read in depth, but I have and can share with all of you. Maybe some of you have been looking to this have already looked at it, but no, I'm sorry, I don't have any helpful to answer your question. <laughs> so let's move on to other parts of what you guys. Okay. Um, so the uh, other part of this was um, regarding the setbacks that are required for an ADU, and we had discussed whether or not they should be the same as an accessory structure. Uh, in other words, a garage, can they be allowed to be three feet from the property lines? Um, I don't think we came to a decision on that, but felt that perhaps that would be fine, um, given the size of the buildings, that they were basically the same size and proportion of a, a garage, that they wouldn't really feel any different on a lot as far as, as, far as the look and feel of the structure. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure it's a matter of of that so much as a matter of use and the need to separate the use from adjacent properties. Be because when you're dealing with somebody sleeping in a building, you go to a hundred level in terms of, of safety. You know what? My my house, just because it's, it's been there for a hundred years, it only has like two feet from the property line. You know, we're set back two feet from our neighbors. Well, I understand. Yeah, but... Yeah. What was, what was standard in the industry 100 years ago, yeah. I, I don't think should hold us. Well, should be a standard that we live to or die to. <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just asking. No, I, mean, yeah. I mean, that's we, what we've always been. I mean, yeah, we can all, yeah, my issue with this whole, whole subject has always been, especially when you talked about trying to repurpose existing garages, 
is that they have to come up to standards of, of current building codes. But I think we've stipulated in order to have this conversation that that has to be a given. Well, I think this issue of, of setbacks is inherent in that conversation. That Personally, I mean, that's my opinion. They have to meet all fire and building codes, safety codes, or else. I mean, obviously they do. I don't even know why we have to feel like that. They would, right? So we're just talking about, about zoning codes. I would say, by the way, I'd much rather have someone sleeping in a building next to my house than a garage where someone is storing gas and has a car and is, you know, <laughs> if you yeah. want to talk about preferences, I mean, I, I, all that is to say is that probably people have different tolerances for what happens in the yard next to them. So I'm not sure we can come up with a, a policy like that because the preferences might be all over the place. We have safety codes. There's a comment from Kevin. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Kevin, I'm not looking at the Zoom anymore, so, um, <laughs> you're going to have to struggle to get attention. Kevin, what's your, would you like to say your comment, Kevin? Yeah, it just when it comes to the area, maybe story limitations, I think that restricting them, I don't want to make the decision for you, uh, but just offer some advice. Um, essentially, if you would like to restrict the number of stories, our perspective has always been that as soon as you create a habitable floor that meets the dimensions of the building code for minimum either ceiling height or room area, you know, whether that's your ceiling height, your, your width or something like that, we're counting that as a second story and previously was prohibited. So I think utilizing the stories as, as a means of restricting what you'd like um, is, is a good measure um, other than an area where you could kind of manipulate first and second story. So that's how I think that's something that I think you guys should probably continue to use. Kevin, would one and a half stories have any meaning in terms of your assessment of habitable space? Or is that just something you couldn't, wouldn't be functional to mention for you to compute? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what a half story is other than the roof area being an attic space or storage space. Um, I think it needs to be, an, you know, an integer, whether it's one or two stories. Kevin, um, I referred to the application for um, 650 Montgomery, where we learned that a certain amount of space could be like treated as a mezzanine under the building code uh, or a loft. Is that would that be the case in this kind of building? Uh, no, that actually that mezzanine restriction is uh, pertains strictly to the building code, which is. Uh, commercial buildings. Um, so that is one third the floor area um, is exempt, or if you sprinkler the building, it's it's up to one half of the floor area below. And there's a couple other stipulations there, but when it comes to residential, those same exemptions don't apply in the residential code. So folks, if we want to have an upper level that's occupied, Kevin's point of view, we have to allow for a two story. Building. Now, we could still have a height limit that's the number of feet. That's fine. But that's how you regulate it. That's fine. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I think it's only for the sake of trying to describe what the structure looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as far as the building code is concerned, the zoning code, you can certainly call it two stories or allowed. I mean, just for uh, another example, I do believe this is how the Mansard roof came into play, <laughs> was like they limited no third story so they just popped a couple windows in the roof and well the same thing with dormers stores. too dormers would extend your space yeah but i'm also thinking about like finished space you know like an insulated space versus an attic space that would not be like if you're converting a garage into a habitable space there would be measures taken <coughs> to make it habitable not just to quantify it based on uh, how tall is it, or is there actually a floor you can walk on, or, you know what I mean? So there's building codes, and it, yeah. it's quite a feat to do that with your garage. Let's, let's keep <laughs> conversions into a second conversation. Yeah, and we did discuss that too. Well, yeah, we let's talk about, about new construction the, first, yeah. and then come to conversions. The, I think it's a totally different beast. 
the work, the, the work and, and the models that are coming from the West, I'm assuming are almost all entirely new construction? Well, that's a good mm -hmm. question. I think it's a mixture. But, and, I, and honestly, I could take you around town and I could show you uh, a building that you would swear was 80 years old and it's brand new. So, in terms of garages that have lofts uh, that were built in the last 10 years. Uh, by the way, the, 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 the model code language from AARP or the, the you know, it, it suggests regulating lightly, but it mentions that Burlington, I guess, Vermont has an ADU ordinance and it's 30% of the main building or 800 square feet is a cap. So if you have a really big house, you can have a really big guest house. So, oh, so whichever is larger. Whichever is larger. What are they, uh, they, how do they describe that 800 square feet? Is gross square footage or? They, it's like, we'd have it to just go. says 800 square feet. Yeah, I think, I think it's meant to be the floor area. That's the, you okay. know. So the largest floor area houses in Arbor are around 6,000 square feet. So, you know, be careful. <laughs> be careful. I don't want to reverse it. I'd say it's the lesser of 30 percent. Yeah, that's I mean, what I was I, you know, but it, it, it gets to like what, what's the point here, right? And so, it, you know, it, it, the point is to allow people to create dwelling units, then, you know, uh, give them a canvas to do that. So, yeah. um, what else did you guys um, discuss? The other thing was uh, complying with current established building footprint, lot coverage limits, obviously. Um, and so, you know, previous area, you can't. Um, and also locating in the third lot layer only. So that's another comment. Yeah, yeah we, we had, had a little disagreement because <laughs> there are cases where you can locate a garage in the second lot layer. We we didn't quite um, read through that completely. Yeah, there's a section of the code that indicates the garage. <laughs> there's a question of would it be so bad to have an ADU in the second lot layer? You know, under the circumstances that you could have a garage in the second lot layer. That'd be so awful. I think it had to do with driveways coming in from the back side mm -hmm. or from the side, yeah. From the side. Yeah, it's quarter Chloe and I were talking about earlier, but quarter quarter properties yeah. get complicated when you get into this issue. And that's your garage that's not that's in the house garage, isn't it? Or is it a self standing garage? Um, Sure. Because yeah, you can have a garage ten feet tall from the lot layer line, I think, which is often in the second lot line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's there's a. Uh... Steve and I did already have a conversation about this today, and there are a lot of buildings that are partially in one lot layer and partially in another lot layer in terms of existing buildings, and I think that would have come up when people if people wanted to add an ADU that there's a line. But to fit the building in a good place on the lot, it might want to be half in one lot layer, half in another. So mm -hmm. I don't want to address that. You may want to offer a little flexibility, like most of the buildings in the third lot layer. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> the doors we, we were we we were talking about there are cases where the plane of the garage, the front plane of the garage, is actually in front of the front plane of the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mull that one over. Yeah. <laughs> um, just because the house is so far set back. No, it's just that that's the way it was built. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there could be a conditional use situation where it has to be looked at in an individual basis. I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, it's conditional and, use is tricky because that gets council involved, and right. yeah. I don't think we want right. to make it that complicated because that will become a whole scene. Um, I mean, I'm probably okay with it. The I don't know what the right language is, but second and third lot layer seems kind of okay to me. I would I would like to dodge it more into the third lot layer, but but you know I think for me as long as it's not in the first lot layer, we're getting a long way to. I'm wondering right if it could have something to do with build out, to frontage build out, because if you start getting a real big garage, I mean, if we're saying 800 square feet, and they can have something really long for that reason, but maybe the frontage build that won't allow them to have it be that long in the second lot layer. Then it would only be if it becomes a frontage. 
Right, but if it's in the second lot layer, it would become part of the frontage, unless it's six foot back, I guess. Right. <laughs> it's well, complicated. Well, yeah. no, it, let's uh, say, I, I'm, I'm thinking like these, these you know, New Orleans Shopping houses, you know, what are they, like 15 feet wide? Uh, you know, yeah. You know, how long are they? Not even. Probably. My house is 15 feet wide. <laughs> Like 12, 12 feet more Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, they can get pretty long and skinny that one. Unless you, unless you put it to the, into the code, the, you know, a proportional, right. you know, ratio. Which I think is maybe something we should consider. Yeah. yeah. I think we need to do a little more work on the floor plate. Yeah. Yeah. But let's, let's see what we Some have in cases. mind so we can kind of. And we're only talking about new construction right now, so we can talk about conversions in a second. So, yeah. mostly in third lot layer, but maybe in second, a little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. So, you could codify that, say, at least two thirds of the building area should be located in the third lot. I mean, is that the new one? Yeah. Uh, two that. stories. Yeah, I can imagine that you could have some maximum percentage to go into a second lot layer. Two stories, 16 foot height. And maximum livable area of 800 square feet. It's yeah. 16 feet to this midpoint. That's the, the, roof. That's yeah. the existing uh, uh, height limit on an accessory. accessory. Yeah. 16. 16 feet to the, the midpoint, midpoint of, of the, the midpoint roof. of the slope. Yeah. Maximum livable space 800, and that's where we're suggesting can we create a floor plate as opposed to maximum living space. Right. Um, and then setbacks, the same as in code that exists. For accessory structures? Yes. Yeah. As, and same with the coverage limits. Right. And then the last thing we talked about was the parking issue, whether or not it would carry an additional parking space. I think you suggested it should. Well, yeah. Again, <laughs> no, <laughs> disagreement. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> so to be determined. I. Yeah. Yeah, we, we talked about this last time, though, didn't we? Last yeah. time we talked about this. I don't think we concluded anything. So is there someone who's arguing that there should not be an additional parking space? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't think there should be any more parking. <laughs> I don't think we right. should require I mean, something that small. I don't think we should require any kind of parking. Well, well you you can have you could have a. A couple living in there with two cars. Yeah, but you could also sure. have a grandma living in there with no car. Well, and that's part of the part, part of the issue is that cars, like that the space for the cars, takes valuable real estate. It t it tends to increase the impervious coverage and the stormwater runoff, and it sort of runs counter to the whole. But the problem is that they end up on the street. And that's that's a problem. If we if that's really a problem, then maybe we should talk about not allowing them. Be it just be it ineligible for a street parking sticker or something like that. Well, that's possible too. Um, if that's really a problem, but yeah, you know, how would you? You know, if you had your your mother-in-law living out there, you know, if she was living in the house, she could have as many cars as she wanted. You know, I mean, because we allow unrelated people, or you know, I guess they're still related, to live together. That's the thing I always say about parking. The natural variations in the household, like the house where I live in now, the other day there were five cars <laughs> at that house because there were five people driving who yeah. were living in that house. If you'd gone to that house three years ago, there would have been one car. Mm -hmm. Why? Because two people got partners and two people got driver's licenses. <laughs> Next year, there will be three cars or two cars because two of them are going to college. You know what I'm saying? So like, well, the, the variations in any block, the number of cars, yeah. goes up and down really into so many more things. It's also it's a question of utility versus design. I mean, you know, you can design a perfect site plan for your car to do a beautiful three point turn and turn around and get out, but when you have um, you know, whatever, in laws over or whatever and you know, you've got three cars in the driveway Obviously, utility becomes priority over de design, and you know, following protocol for how it's to be, how the how the cars um, are accommodated, and how to, the whole plan is to be used. Um, I have seen small accessory dwelling units with 
um, kind of like an overhang, which is sort of like a carport. It's not enclosed, but it provides sort of like said space for the car. And then the other half of the footprint of the first floor footprint is habitable space. And then there's a second floor, whatever it is, whether it's a gambrel or a clipped, you know, the spring line, you know, whatever it is. But that's like sort of a new, maybe not new, but it's a different approach to a similar problem. I'm not, and not to be confused, I'm not advocating. We're really just talking about that when we're required. Require it, yeah. Not, not like how it's designed. So let's yeah. focus on, do you want to require somebody to have a parking space, an extra parking space that they have a problem with? I, I, I don't. I mean, I do not, but again, I think if, there, if we're, people are interested in the topic of parking, it should be addressed holistically at the town level by studying parking. Which we have, actually, right? Coming this study. month. Yeah, Coming yeah. Exactly. So I think, yeah. that, I think, you know, maybe that yeah. will inform the conversation. Yeah. The United States has like one billion parking spaces. It's only 350 million Americans. It's out of control. It's out of control. Well, let's see if the parking study comes up. But are there, is there anyone here who's strongly in the camp that yes, we need to require a, a parking spot? No. The, um, the model just suggests, and I'm not saying you have to do this, just uh, if a parking, an off street sca parking space is removed when constructing the ADU, you could require that they replace it if you felt like. Oh, so their driveway was put in for it or something? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the, the house, the main house, should be able to reduce its parking. Right, I think that would be a good idea. Well, no, not it should comply with the code. It should yeah. not go yeah. into a non compliant right. status, I guess, maybe, but it's like, that's where it's like you look at the way people use their garages, they use their garages to store their lawnmowers. Yeah. I mean, right. they're not really right. parking spaces. Yeah. Bicycle parking. Yeah, bicycles, I mean, whatever, you know, garden tools. Okay, so we're getting close here. It feels like the main thing we still need to work out is like what's a what's a way to express a building program for new construction. If we have an idea of what we feel the appropriate overall scale is, how do you express a building footprint as a size or a proportion or something, as opposed to a number of square feet of habitable space? Right. Is that really off the table that we're not going to regulate the square foot? No, but I think we should try to see. I mean, to stick with the form-based code, the form-based code. If you had a number, see the problem. The thing is, we regulate by form for reasons, for particular reasons. I mean, if you had a 800 square foot rule, just say, you know, you could have a 20 by 40 foot building. I don't know if you want a 20 by 40. Is that a form you? You're willing to spend your your building footprint a lot, then a lot. Well, but part of the form-based code is to is a way of, of, of uh, guiding development so that it somehow reflects the form of the community that, that exists, right, or the form that's desired. Well, I think that, I think that the, the point that was made about it not um, being proportionately, it needs to be proportionately smaller than the main building. Right. So you're not going to put an 800 square foot footprint next to a house that's an 800 so, square foot yeah. footprint. What's that's, that may be the goal. Well, Vermont is saying if you have an 800 square foot house, then the ADU can be 800 square feet because they have like these little Victorian cottages that are tiny, right? But it's I think the idea is that there's a minimum size that's below which it becomes impractical. Like you're regulating it down to being useless, right? Potentially. Well, well what if we had some some maximum percentage, like no more than I'll just twenty five percent of the square footage can be in the second lot there. That will start to regulate it. True, sure, but I think we're also right now we're just talking about the overall size. No, I know, but I'm that way I just saying in terms of when you talk about you can't stretch and, it out. Yeah. yeah. Well what's the difference between building a long ADU and building a three car garage? I mean why re why regulate the footprint of one and not the other? Yeah, are it so except for you um, structures are not regulated in size yeah. at all. Yeah, they just have to be smaller than the so, principal structure. But why are we why are we talking about limiting the footprint of just this kind of accessory structure? When it would be because I think this is an accessory structure that is 
more apt to be expanded in square footage? I don't know about that. I mean, if, uh, someone, if someone has a buildable lot to, to put in a four car garage, why well, not? We're not seeing that happen. So, I mean, it's not, we're not being overrun by four car garages in order. But I mean, if somebody has the money, you know, and a, and you know, uh, an in-law, you, know, you know, wants a, as big a place as possible, and they can afford it, then they'll do it. Mm -hmm. Unless we have a way to regulate the size. That's why I think we should go with floor space. Well, right. Well, the floor space also would be for the dwelling unit because I'll just also bring up that uh, classical eight garage apartments are sometimes built over the garage. And there are, like, you know, on Elmwood, it's interesting because, you know, I live in a twin house and there's some small houses and there's twins and then the end of the street is large houses on large lots with swimming pools. And, you know, it wouldn't be out of place. In fact, they may already have one that's a garage with a uh, apartment over it. And it looks fantastic. So I, I wouldn't, I mean, I think, um, you know, thinking that everything has to be shrunk down, it, it's it's really about like how much do you what's proportional, right, to the site and to the existing to the to the main structure. And that's why I brought up the example of integrated parking that's not a garage per se, because you know there just to sort of expand the concept of what is this unit, the successor unit, and what how can it be configured without saying. If you want more parking, you have to build a garage, or you have to get a parking stand. Well, it sounds like we need to do a little more work on this particular. I think. I mean, the other the other aspect of this holistically that always has bothered me is, you know, we we talk on the assumption that we're we're building a model for like elderly parents who are going to move in. But the, the scenario that's always disturbed me is, and when they are regrettably gone, and it becomes a rental unit for students, which is what, what's going to happen, you know, what do we do about that? Is that bad? Is that a really it's bad? It's not great. Well, I, 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 I actually mean, do you, you want a bunch of college students living it's only yeah. 800 square yeah, feet. Yeah, they're, 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 with, they're with a couple of really yeah. big speakers in them. Well, yeah, come on. well I, think, I think part of that is that the idea is that, uh, I mean, obviously, if it's, if it's, if it's not an owner-occupied property, um, you know, there's less control. But the idea is that a lot of the application for this is for owner-occupied properties to have uh, an accessory unit that, that could either be used for family members which is very common, or, or could be rental property, in which case the rental income makes the main unit much more affordable. So, like, for example, if we're trying to provide uh, housing units for uh, teachers, police, fire, and so on, like, you know, well, actually, you volunteer fire company, but you see my point. Like, um, you know, that accessory income from the second unit can make a substantial uh, contribution to the right. mortgage. Yeah. Uh, and then for the, for the for the large speakers, like you know, it's the main the people in the main house are not going to want uh, uh, nuisances, right? So there's you know the, I'm not saying that it's a perfect solution. I'm just pointing out there's a lot of yeah. I mean scenarios. the whole thing of occupancy is just well, it comes back to enforcement again. Yeah, and that's, that's I the mean it's a line to draw, you know. <laughs> you never well, know. you enforce your nuisance ordinances is what you do, right? Yeah. So if you're noisy, <coughs> it's, it's hard. Right? Yeah. That's always Wait, a problem, you can't, no matter what. You can't come up with a policy that prescribes, that's kind of calculated to prevent certain kinds of people from moving in because they might do something. I mean, well, you can, actually, because I don't think as we've talked about more of <laughs> students are not a protected class. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing the law here. I was just saying from, a, from an ethical or moral point of view, I don't think it's right yeah. to, to preemptively exclude certain yeah. kinds of people because yeah. they might do something. Now I've got a college kid and two more live with me where I live. I mean, you know, I wouldn't. And they're quiet. You know. Studious. No. <laughs> I won't say anything because we're on Zoom here. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't think that, I think if, they, if people create a nuisance, then that's right. You, you deal with it as, as an enforcement issue. Yeah. Um, 
And by, by the way, that's with the height limit. I mean, again, like I, I do re recognize we don't want to to perhaps overdevelop, but the, you know, I think some consideration should be given to having apartments over the parking, you know, because and that does push the volume but, up. But I agree. I don't think that's a bad model. I've I spent the last few few weeks <laughs> staring intently into third lot layers to look at garages, and yeah, that model is not a terrible model. I um, guess we've got to require reuse. more than 16 feet. You know? Well, and, and I guess I'm, a lot of that might be reused, but it would, it would you know, the, the, the ground floor is the 10 foot garage podium, and then you have to put the, the, the second floor above it, and so you're going to need, I mean, you're going to need some vertical walls. I mean, you can, depends how big your garage is, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, just something to think about. Oh, and, you know, and then with architecture, I know we're prescribing sort of, we have the, the historic district and, you know, compli c compatibility with the uh, railroad suburb. Um, you know, but there is some modern architecture in the borough as well, and, and there's the opportunity for expressing modern architecture, you know, shed, shed roofs and uh, instead of uh, gables and so on. So. Well, I think a number of people in the past years have built garage structures that could easily be, that meet our accessory uh, structure code that could easily be converted into uh, so people have figured out how to put apartments over garages already. I think I think the metrics we have in our code allow for that. As to different roof types, Heidi is is often commented on that. I think that's <laughs> I prefer to deal with that as a separate matter. Yeah, understood. Um, so it, it feels to me like the main thing we have to work out here is either the floor plate or the side. Well, a certain number of square feet might sound right, we might need to look at it more carefully um, in terms of the proportion of that to the main building or the dimensions. But otherwise, I think we're pretty close to having a set of ideas where it's, we don't have a complete consensus on all of them, but I think we have a strong consensus on all of them. So in the sake of moving on, maybe we could say like that's the one isolated issue we still need to work on. Now, in terms of conversions uh, of existing buildings, uh, I'll, I'll just note, Jim Cornwell wrote me a note about this today. He was not as uh, 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 he had a few reservations about that, um, mostly because of where some uh, existing garages tend to be located on the lot, which is like against a lot line. So what would your thoughts be about conversions? Would, would you allow conversions, but only if they happen to also meet the setback requirements? That's a tough one. Well, you, I mean, you would have to comply with, with, the, with the code regulated fire rating on those walls. Right. And, you know, in my experience, doing that with existing construction would be very difficult. Right. You know, so, you know, there are other reasons why I don't like it right up against the lot line, but, or within the setback. But I think the primary one in Turkey, talking about conversions, is you start, you start getting into the area of how much and we've seen this, for instance, at the, the house that's finishing construction on Dudley. At what point does a remaining, a remaining structure be considered a, a renovation when so much of it has been changed that, that the, the, they're really playing the code? So, I mean, you have an old garage that's right up on a lot line, and you strip it down to the studs and there's nothing, absolutely nothing left, but you're just renovating because, look, see, there are a couple of walls there. You know, and I, I think that's, that's really stretching the intent. You talk about where you're keeping a foundation or keeping a concrete pad or something yeah. like yeah. that. And, totally between, not for your and maybe a few studs and yeah. nothing else. Just yeah. yeah. shit, you know, just one word at a time. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's but, we, but we've seen it happen. Yeah. It but, does happen. But just, so just to point out a couple things, like one is think of, think of Elmwood and Rockland as examples. Elmwood backs up to the railroad tracks. No harm, no foul. There's nothing to set back from. It's just trees and embankment. Rockland is a street, but it's really an alley half the time, right? It's both, it has houses fronting onto it, but it also is just a wall of 
accessory garages. And so, I mean, I don't see the, that there's, I mean, in terms of lot layers, like in reality, the cottage probably should face onto Rockland and be like a little cottage, right, where the garage is. And I, I mean, I think the model code suggests to, to treat them like ADUs. I'm sorry, you know, accessory structures that you simply are inhabiting. So the, the setbacks would be the same as for any other accessory. Except, I guess what we're talking about is garages where the setbacks are not conforming. Well, but they're, then I think they're already there, you know. And that's why some of these garages actually have party walls and houses have party walls. I mean, what's the difference? Well, the interesting thing is they're already there, but they're there as garages. And if you if you're changing the use of the building, does that change your opinion of whether it's appropriate? Like, yes. If you I wanted mean, to re fix it up, well, is it, it, it does for me. Uh, after 40 years of being an architect, I, you know, I, I just have this inherent belief that the, the, the building, the life safety codes exist for that level of extra protection when you have somebody living and sleeping in a place, and you don't casually show your shoulders. Well, you know, it's existing, so it's okay. It's not okay. But you know, you have to, you have to. If you're going to make that kind of a renovation and change of use, you've got to bring it up to the current code. I see Kevin Walsh has turned his camera on. Kevin, do you have any comments mm -hmm. on this topic? Yeah, I completely agree um, in what was just said. In terms, of, in terms of changing the use, that's something I look at specifically. Um, I know it's residential, um, and residential doesn't exclusively call parking like an S2 use group. Um, but it's it's parking. It's uninhabitable. It's not occupied. It's occupied by a vehicle, but not by people, whether it's sleeping room or habitable space. Uh, when you come in and renovate it potentially somewhere, a room or space where someone's now sleeping or, or occupying, uh, yeah, that's completely different in, in my terms of view and how I'm reviewing it uh, from a life safety issue, whether that's exterior wall openings, fire ratings, things like that. Um, so, so part of me is saying, yeah, the, the zoning code doesn't necessarily need to infringe on those requirements because they're already built in. Um, but I do see the point. So you would address it as a life safety issue, but not as a setback issue. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. Exactly. So if they're able yes. to meet those fire safety, I mean, if they're able to renovate successfully. Is the, and maybe they have sprinklers, they have firewalls, you know, and so on, right? It's out in the I mean, I still think that there is a life safety issue with the proximity to a property line, but I think it is primarily a life safety issue. It's not a light and air issue. And for that matter, yeah, the model of the garage underneath the unit is fine, but you really got to treat that separation, you know, very carefully, meaning a real, a real appropriate fire separation and and probably sprinklers and, you know. But that's not really... Not, not that cars burst into flames these days. It's <laughs> that, that, again, you that have would a be gasoline. It's the same as this house. I mean, that, that this, that this... Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And they have, and as new construction, they have that kind of separation built into it. Um, so, so, Kevin, now, if, if, if the life safety codes have to be met, what would be the objection to allowing an existing garage to be converted to residential, even if the setbacks were not conforming? If, if we assume the fire codes and the building codes have to be met, they're going to have to be met in any case, no matter what you do, whether wherever the garage is on the line. But does it really matter that the setbacks are not conforming? As long as those other codes are met. No, no. Again, you're you're changing the use, so I'm looking at it. It's not just a zoning issue; it's a building, the building code right. issue. You're gonna have to right. need a building permit for this, and a new. I mean, there will be a certificate of occupancy issued for this because it's a non-habitable space previously. So again, I don't think the zoning code needs to overgovern, if that's the word I'd like to use. I, I think the building code kind of self-controls these. I think the zoning code's biggest issue is figuring out where, what districts you want them in. And I, I do think the size of them is, is the biggest rule that you guys maybe want to work out. Okay. Um, I guess one question I have is, um, you know, we're talking about international building code, but international, what about international existing building code? International existing building code 
is similar but much more lenient in terms of if you have an existing building and you are taking off the cladding and leaving the studs and foundation, it basically, the, the basic underlying, with few exceptions, rule for international existing building code is you can put it back exactly the way it was as long as you don't make it any more dangerous. So... Well, well two issues here. One is the change in use. Change in which, use because you would require the two-hour firewall for the garage. Well, change in use for, for all sorts of reasons under the under whatever IBC you use. But the second is, and what we were just talking about, and this is a, a question to Kevin, at what point do you take so much of the original construction out that you don't really consider it under the uh, existing building code anymore because it's for all intents and, intents and purposes a new building? Yeah, that's, that's a really tough one, and each municipality kind of creates its own set of rules for that. Um, what we use and what I've always used was um, whether you're utilizing the existing um, exterior walls or bearing walls. Um, some places, like I came from Illinois and Philly, uh, if there was a certain percentage of floor area, like floor joists that you were moving, two thirds, that was the trigger. So I like to use the exterior wall um, as that. Then some people will go ahead and manipulate that and say, well, the exterior walls will stay the same. We'll take out all the guts of the building. We'll just keep the walls where they're at and we'll just use that as a finish. Uh, the loophole there to be up front is that um, you can say that those exterior walls are then inadequate structurally. You can provide some sort of structural report and say those exterior walls now need to go and now you got to kind of get a new building for, for free. Uh, but when it's reviewed as, as kind of an existing building. You know, you're kind of penalizing yourself. So that's that's like a municipality-based um, restriction there, and I think mine's the exterior walls. I, I kind of feel like <laughs> this is like way overthought. I mean, if it's too much of a hassle, people are just going to knock their garage down and build something new. <laughs> but then they'll definitely have to be accepted. They're not looking for a credit here. That's right. Well, we have a, yeah, that's right. Lot, like. But, but <laughs> step back's only three feet. You know, and so we're only talking about those few number of garages that are between three feet and zero feet, which may actually someone be big enough that someone wants to convert. And they're probably and already. It makes in more sense to convert them to knock them down and tear them down. And so I, mean, I don't know. I feel like we're just going down a super rabbit hole here. I mean, yeah, that's right. The the you know any building that's going to be built is going to meet fire safety and life safety codes. I mean that isn't given. And so the only question is. Is, is it okay if someone tries to convert a garage that's within that little three foot setup? Well, what, about, what about if someone has an existing garage that's on the property line, you know, it doesn't mean setback, but it's a very modest one story garage and they want to use it to, you know, expand it into a, a larger ADU? I mean, that's possibly one concern. Uh, is, is that I good? assume that would, that would be some kind of new construction that would require you know, meeting on the setback. Meeting the setback. Oh, okay. Right. Or we can simply say, we can simply say, you can flip it over and say, because this is probably likely to happen never in our lifetimes, or maybe once, you can only convert an existing building if it meets the setback requirements. And if it doesn't meet the setback requirements, what? you can't what? convert. No, I mean, like, again, like, like the Rockland. It's like a binary choice here. I walked by that garage today, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I mean, Rock, Rockland. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Kevin's taken us on a journey. No, no, no. Adam. Yes. Adam. Adam, sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is this looks to me like it, it's a garage. It's built on the rear property line on Rockland, uh, for example. There's several of there's some of them are too small. Set, the curb measure, setbacks are measured from the curb, so it's three feet setback. If you measure from the curb, then yeah, I guess it's three feet, but but it's probably on the I don't know where the parcel line is, but I mean, you know, it's I think the well, parcel line is usually in the often in the middle of the street. That's why we measure setbacks from curbs. Hey. It, you'd have to look, but it's like that. What I'm getting at is, I mean, I think, uh, you know, could this could this structure be turned into a? Is that on a property line? Is that a twin garage? Some some are there, and some are. I don't know if that one specifically is, but there are there are some on Rockland that are that are but, I think this one's on. not, but that's where you know that's where I know at our street that it's quite common to have a shared driveway with. 
garage that's connected to the shared driveway that had a party wall on the lot line. You know, those, those kind of scenarios. And I think as long as it meets the um, life safety and building up, if it can get a certificate of occupancy based on those rules, then it seems to be you know, within the scope of this. And if it would be concerned to say if you want to expand it, then you can only expand it by so much, or else you have to get the setback. Well, I mean, and even for me, it's like if you wanted to put an uh, apartment over this garage, I, I don't see the problem with it personally. I mean, well, that one seems to meet the setbacks actually. Yeah, so you throw them on the side also. Well, this is if this is looks like here is the lot line. So yeah, that's what I'm talking. It's like three feet. You know, it's it's an accessory. So that yeah. one you could do, looks like. Yeah. yeah. And meet it within the, what we're talking about. Maybe the one of the one of the things that we're we're looking at is that three foot setback. Um, and again, the the life safety building code issue will actually kind of restrict what you're able to do with that setback because the exterior openings are restricted by how far or close you are to the property lines. And then in addition to that, you also have egress issues from bedrooms or habitable areas. So if you're too close to a property line, and you can't provide windows, you can't have rooms. So kind of th those setbacks are actually restricting what you can do with those spaces as well. In other words, if you're right on a property line, you can't have a bedroom there because you can't have an egress window there. Unless there's one on the other side. <laughs> well, I, I feel like, yeah. again, it's sort of a binary choice. Yeah. Uh, you know, do you allow reconstruction on a foundation or, or on a building that exists where you just simply say any ADA has got to meet the current setup? I mean, it's a simple choice. Okay, well, I think we should Okay, so let's move on then. <laughs> because it's late, I'd like to table the rest of the conversation about infill housing and move on to Windwood Road, because I know Adam has done a lot of work on this topic, and I'd like Adam to talk with us about what he's done. Um, but I'll set it up for a second if I could. So Adam's, Adam's consideration of this issue, of this issue, of course, grew out of our consideration of 3M with that application, and the thinking about what kinds of um, improvements to Woodward Road could be necessary, uh, would be useful now, and would certainly be necessary if people are actually living on that road. And, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the case that we can request or require the developer to make any of these improvements, but it's good to know what we'd like to do. And some of them, Adam has pointed out, these improvements might actually be contingent on how the developer builds the site. And it might be something the developer could actually build as they're constructing their project. Uh, Laura Marion's contribution in this conversation is that, well, there's some big developments that are probably going to occur within the next decade or so. St. Uh, St. Charles, uh, uh, Chris Lesswing believes the, the Frit Shopping Center, uh, where Giant is, could one day be redeveloped. It's sort of you know, the kind of place that, that gets upgraded every couple of decades. Um, and so that a look at that, at Windwood Road, really ought to take into consideration that whole corridor. And, and so that's Lower Marion's point of view. It is their road for the most part, and it's PennDOT's road for the most part, so any conversation needs to figure out how we evolve or navigate those sources. But what I hope we can do is identify a path to getting some realistic and maybe tiered, relatively quick, and, rel and then on the other hand, relatively aspirational uh, improvements that can be suggested and put on the agenda of the borough, put on the agenda of the township, so that if a development comes along, we can establish a connection, or if a grant comes along, we can establish a need. You know? So, Adam, so my goal is to get counsel to say yes, go ahead and take the next steps necessary to give us something. Uh, Samantha Bryant, uh, when I told her we were talking about this, said I, I'm all in and I want to, I kind of want to lead the charge for the borough. So we actually have a staff advocate uh, on this. So Adam, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so All right, so I, um, I prepared just a couple of slides to have for the discussion. And so the, the basic idea is that 
when the three on one application was made, it showed completely reconstructing the entire curve for essentially an entire block of several hundred feet, plus a number of lateral cuts all the way across the road surface because the sewer and infrastructure was on the opposite side of the road. So you would be cutting open the pavement and redoing the curve, um, moving the sidewalk. You're essentially reconstructing a lot of the street. Um, whenever you do that, it's an opportunity to think about uh, the cross-section of the road. So in a lot of cities, like Philadelphia, for example, whenever they would remill the blacktop and put down new blacktop, that's when they would go in and put the bike lanes in, for example, or consider do I want to put the road on a road diet? If, is anyone not familiar with the term road diet? I am not familiar. The idea with road diet is if, if we if, if we look at this cross section on the on the zoom, um, can you guys see the, the photograph? I still see your no, screenshot properly after. Um, yeah, probably after. Yeah. Do you see the picture of with of uh, Winwood Road? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the idea with the road diet is that. Um, you may have designed the road with extra pavement that isn't really required to meet the function of traffic. And that tends to, that can encourage traffic to uh, uh, be less safe because people don't drive as safely as they should. And then also you may have other goals like moving bicycles or pedestrians or uh, creating a better civic realm that you could put that space to, to those uses instead. So in the case of Wynwood, if we think about the road, it carries the same volume of traffic at, um, at uh, you know, the, the, the road that goes past Lower Marion, uh, or Marion Elementary, uh, Bowman. Bowman Avenue, as it does at the tunnel, right? It's the same number of cars in both locations, um, but the road is actually, I think it's over 40 feet wide by the, in this particular block of three on wood. Um, because, in a, and the reason it is that wide is originally the road was had a really sharp turn. That's why the property line is uh, for for the borough it, and 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 Marion don't quite meet. Like that's why part of their property is in Lower Marion because that used to be where the road was. And uh, the road curve was eased by PennDOT some 50 years ago. And in the process, I think they basically um, laid out it with a, with a very generous cross section. So the current cross section is probably even wider than this. But measuring from the aerial photos, it's about 41 feet wide. Um, and it's divided into uh, two travel lanes, you know, north and south, plus an auxiliary turn lane on the right to, to turn right under the tunnel, plus essentially an eight or a nine foot shoulder, which I saw a car parked on today with more than enough room. I mean, it's, it's just a totally leftover space. Um, the, the right turn lane is significant because it was called out by the, the borough traffic engineer as one of the hazards related to putting curb cuts in. Because you actually then have to cross two lanes of traffic pulling in and out. Um, and when traffic is stopped and so on, it just creates additional, additional hazard for the person turning. Um, in addition, right turn bays are not particularly useful, especially in this context. Left turn bays are far more useful because often left turning traffic is waiting to clear, um, you know, waiting for a gap in traffic, whereas right turning traffic typically uh, does not have to wait anywhere near as long. And when we look at the traffic volumes, the, the right turn lane um, is unlikely to stack more than one or two cars at a red light anyway, right? So it's not, it's not, it's an entire block of a right turn lane uh, which could stack probably 10 or 15 automobiles, maybe more. Um, and it, it, at most it's probably used by like two during peak hours and zero during off peak because you saw there's like nobody in the photograph, which is pretty common. Um, so at rush hour, there's a lot of traffic. The intersection itself, the level of service of the tunnel intersection um, is lowest on a, coming out from under the tunnel because it only has one lane through the tunnel and, and the light constricts the number of people that can use the intersection. So Wynwood Road is sort of irrelevant to the level of service compared to the, to the, um, the cross section. So the idea is if, if we look at that cross section and how much space is, is sort of left over, um, we can put the road on a diet, which is to say take part of that turn lane and make that into your street trees, uh, tree lawn, I have it seven feet, ideally maybe it'd be eight feet, but the idea is, you know, you could create a tree lawn um, to buffer the sidewalk from the traffic with street trees um, and still basically have the same traffic function. And then take the leftover uh, shoulder 
and put in a protected psychopath. Now we could just drop the psychopath, we don't have to do that, but the idea is that in the Lower Marion original uh, you know, transportation plan, uh, Winwood is shown as a cycle corridor, and generally these days, um, the, the whole um, cities are all moving towards this idea of protecting bicycle lanes with a physical curb between automobiles and bicyclists. Typically just a curb. You can actually just put down those parking curb stops if you want to, you know, you can find tons of photos on the internet, or I can give you some. Um, but that just keeps the motorists from parking in the bike lane, basically. Um, and you want the, the bicycle lane to be safe, essentially, for children. So this is the same amount of, of space, um, carry the same amount of traffic about as well, but now it's going to be much better for bicyclists and much more pleasant for pedestrians because they're buffered from the traffic by a lot more space. Is that, is that making sense so okay. far? Yeah, so the idea is like if they're going to be reeling, reeling the curb anyway and they're going to be opening up the street, you know, why not move to a more modern cross-section? So I did draw it up um, in plan view as well. So this is the overview with, their, with their, the, their, their original development proposal in it with their curb cut. So I didn't move any of their buildings or any of their driveways um, or anything like that. I just, just moved the curb lines. You can see this is the, the um, intersection with North Winwood Avenue at the tunnel. So here the idea is, and you have to figure this out to make sure that the trucks have their turning paths and buses and like whatever the vehicle types are that you have to accommodate, you know, they have to have all of the, the, the swept area path analysis and all that. But the idea is that probably right now this, this uh, splitter, this like little gore area they call it between the um, traffic directions uh, is already there. And the idea is, well, maybe we could put a pedestrian refuge island in with an actual, you know, curb because um, that will help enforce turning traffic uh, to, to not speed and to yield to pedestrians crossing. Um, it shows how you could configure the bicycle way um, at the intersection. Um, I did expand the little pork chop a little bit, that's optional. You could put in some flowers or something um, in, the, in the painted area, you know, or not for a, a community gateway. Um, and so again, their development is in exactly the same place, but then, we, and then you put the street trees um, you know, uh, buffering their development from the street and buffering the sidewalk from the street. So does that make sense so far? So did they have the trees on the other side of the sidewalk? Correct. Okay. Yeah, they had, I think, a two-foot grass strip. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's not practical for anything except grass that struggles to survive. Um, and then if we go down, the real, the real reason to do this, the other big issue here is when we look at Wynwood Road, um, it's 25 miles per hour at the um, Bed Bath & Beyond and the Wynwood train station. In that area, the speed limit is 25 miles an hour, that block. But as we go through Narberth, it's 35 miles an hour. And that is the observed 85th percentile, meaning that 15% of traffic is driving faster than 35, you know, up to 45 and 50. Um, that speed is too fast for motorists to yield to pedestrians. They just don't do it. Which is why the borough engineer, for example, points out you can't put in a marked crosswalk at Woodside, but we have this park on one side, and we have a neighborhood, you know, path to the elementary school, and we have a path to the park, and we have a path to the we people want to go to the supermarket to shop and to the shopping center, so they they can cross here, but we can't put in a marked crosswalk because um, essentially motorists won't actually yield to the pedestrians, right? And we don't want anyone to 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 take a risk that they shouldn't take, if we bring the speed down to the to 25 miles an hour or even lower, we have a, a shot at getting motorists to yield to pedestrians, which they're supposed to do legally. Um, so the idea with this is that by by again narrowing the roadway, um, it still meets all of the geometric requirements. Um, we will be better able to enforce 25 miles an hour and bring the speed limit from 35 to 25 and install um, pedestrian crossings. Um, you could be, go even further and put in speed uh, pillows, they're called, or speed tables. Um, that has happened, for example, in Philadelphia on Cobbs Creek Parkway. Yes, I just drove that the other day. And that was done, Amazing. unfortunately, because several people were killed first. <laughs> and so, uh, there was so many people speeding and it's right next to the park and people were, were getting hit. And so they have gone in, they've, they've put in, uh, it's one travel lane and then there's speed pillows and so on. And um, so that is, the, the, those tools can be used, uh, splitter islands can be used at crosswalks. I, I've drawn it even, you could raise the entire intersection up 
to the sidewalk level. So it's essentially one big speed table. These things are all designed to keep the car traveling at around 20 miles an hour to still be comfortable for motorists at an appropriate speed, but not to drive at a speed that risks the lives of people crossing to and from the park. Um, so the, the final, I guess, point is that, I guess, Marion would be interested, Laura Marion would be interested in doing a corridor study for the, the one or two miles of uh, Wynwood Road, um, and that would be great. But I, I would, I'm personally worried about the, uh, the perfect being the enemy of the good, where, uh, you know, bigger projects take longer or may never happen, versus tactical projects that we could accomplish, you know, in, in bites, right? So we could... The, the Elmwood project, for example, could have been an opportunity to move the curb line, maybe not put in the bike path yet, but to set up the framework for future improvements. We could, as was mentioned, maybe we get grants for some community gateways or we get a, a grant for traffic coming at Woodside and we do it piece by piece, but it could add up to that full corridor uh, you know, over the next few years. Uh, so that's the idea in a nutshell is that we, we, we uh, try to integrate all of our goals for pedestrians, bicycles, communities, open space, traffic safety, and get the road designed along those lines. Good. Is any of this segment of the road within the road and arbor? Well, it's our border, so I think that we have, it's, it's both, it, let's put it this way, it's it's Marion's border, Lower Marion, and it's Narborough's border, right? So shouldn't we have equal, <laughs> I mean, the boundary might be like technically on our sidewalk, but I think from a practical standpoint, it's, it belongs to both of us. Um, I would also just point out the full length of Windward Road is a PennDOT owned road. Um, you know, so anything that would occur it is going to be under the approval uh, and blessing of uh, PennDOT. Eric, can you, I know you, we actually have a traffic engineering specialist from Pannonia, but you're here tonight. Right. How would how would we go about getting ideas like this in front of PennDOT? Uh, I mean, so probably your your best way forward. Every municipality has a municipal services rep uh, who is the the municipality's conduit uh, to uh, you know between the PennDOT uh, between PennDOT and the municipal government. So that's probably your your best. That's your point person as a municipality of who you could talk to. Uh, and really start, um, you know, a process uh, of, uh, of this is, we in this municipality, uh, we want to work in this direction. Uh, they also, the more jointly you're working with other municipalities, that becomes even better. Uh, you know, I'm sure, as you're kind of alluding to, Lower Marion also probably has some interests in improving this corridor. Uh, so in the short term, start talking about PennDOT, that would be the best um, you know, way forward. And then just to also put out there in the grander scheme, uh, you know, there is the actual funding from PennDOT for these type of projects. It's the PennDOT Multimodal Pro, uh, Funding Program, uh, which has substantial money. Uh, I think they just awarded, I just pulled up the list, the 2021-2022 projects, uh, and it was tens of millions of dollars of funding. Uh, so like there, there is, and it's projects that are Lord, that are municipal sponsored, two municipalities are fantastic, uh, and that have the greatest benefit. Um, you know, this could could be a project like that. Uh, you know, for the broader area. So I just bring that up uh, as kind of the uh, you know for planning for the future. Uh, but going to your municipal rep is probably your best first step. First step isn't isn't um, Windwood Road north of Lancaster considering some similar changes like this? I think they're thinking about one lane in each direction, returning lane, and sort of yeah. road dialing that, that section of wind. Yeah, there was just a public meeting held, so just not that far, just west of Lancaster. Um, only, the stretch is only like a mile or so. We only got a mile there. And that just held some public meetings are considering a road diet there to reduce from four lanes to three. And I would just add to what Eric said, all of which is great information and true is that PennDOT now has a program where every time they go out and they're repaving a road, they check in with DVRPC, with the county, and with the local municipalities to see if they have anything in their plans related to that road. So they say, okay, before we like repave and restrike this road, 
anybody want to say, oh, we have this plan for this road? And I actually saw in another municipality where they said, oh, we want bike lanes on this road. It's in a plan. And they said, okay, we'll do the engineering for the location of the light, and we will pay for the paint and restriping of it because we're repaving this road. So they even, the municipality didn't end up having to pay anything to record with their project because they happened to hit a pen out repaving. So great to try to take action sooner, but if you have a plan and you say, this is what we want, if you don't manage to get it funded yourself or implemented yourself, have it ready so that it kind of says, okay, we're going to do something with this road. You can say, here, please do this. <laughs> It doesn't always work out, but if you have it ready, it's definitely a plus. But they may not call Narberth because this road is in Lower Mary. No, they would. They would, definitely. If they were dealing with this structured road. Mm -hmm. And they also talked to us. Like, uh, I would hear and our planner for Lower Mary would hear about it now. through their, it's, it's, it's like two years old, this PennDOT Connects process, and it's so much better than yeah. how things used to work. And the kind of and to that, I've also, that's starting to come around. PennDOT has made a concerted effort to try and uh, be more integrated, uh, work better with municipalities to come up with better projects in the end. That is true. Sounds great. I just would remind you too that with the, with the bikeway, again, that's not, that's just one idea. It doesn't have to be, make it into the final plan or not. But we got our pilot uh, two-way bike path on Windsor Avenue for a couple weeks with the BRPC. So that's what the, the photo shows is that Google Street View actually went by when we had that in place. Um, I still see that now. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. Yeah, but you know, again, again like a, most, a lot of cities are moving towards that, that style of, if you're going to have a bike path, a path on the road as the connectors for a lot of it might be worth talking with PennDOT about the two-way cycle track sooner rather than later because I don't know if they, you don't want to design something that they're going to look at and go, no way are we even going to consider this. I don't, I don't know, but they sometimes. Yeah, and again, this, so this was a DVRPC project and that's yeah. why maybe, you know, we could work with the, the county and DVRPC yeah. on those kinds of ideas. Definitely. Um, Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about our goals here, how to get there. So I think our goals are to, uh, to try to come up with uh, some kind of uh, agreed upon strategy that we can use to um, solicit resources and, and, and influence future construction. Mm -hmm. Is that, would that be right? Mm -hmm. And that uh, uh, in that, um, in that we probably want to try to get something of that nature sooner rather than later, because it's quite possible this road could be rebuilt in a year or two. Um, and I can just interject. I think it obviously works very well with the whole green practices initiative, uh, you know, area of work that. I'm thinking about and working on and I haven't gone public with anything but you know obviously it does better inform that effort. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to, I think the brand manager is supportive of working on this which is good and I think that because this is multi-municipal getting borough councils support would be good. Uh, because borough council tells the borough manager what her priorities are. Um, so I think what we have to do is think about what do we, what do we tell council? What we, we can, we can communicate to council. We can uh, communicate. I've already started a conversation with Fred Bush about this. He's the head of the infrastructure committee. He's, he has a, a zillion questions. Um, so I guess what I'm searching for is like what, what do we ask? Council for right now. What process do we want to set in motion to get to where we want to go? Because it's less about the design ideas right now, more about the process of getting the township and getting PennDOT lined up so that even if just for this stretch we can get some better outcomes from the changes we see coming on the horizon. Yeah, I think that's a good 
question, but I'm not sure what that process is. Yeah. Uh, well, we talked about, you know, I mean, I, I, see, I think a lot of this pivots off of wood, wood side, that intersection, and saying that we want to be able to cross the road more safely to the park and, and to the school. But um, I know we talked about with Laura Marion even just having like a charrette, a walkabout kind of idea, you know, and then putting some, maybe from that, putting some concepts down that become the, the sort of preliminary ideas, right? Um, so, is that, what do you think? Or, well, and who's our municipal liaison that Eric, you were talking about, who's that liaison that you were talking about. Uh, his name is Tim Greco. He is uh, your municipal rep for the for this part of Montgomery County? Mm -hmm. Or conversation? They are generally available to just call and talk to. Uh, we can also keep helping. Eric, in what form does a plan have to be adopted for PennDOT to pay attention to it? They have to be adopted. So, Either. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I mean, it's. Go ahead. Um, I mean, it's. What's the best way? I mean, they probably, if you were to start, I mean, talking to your rep, it, it, they're going to give you the best uh, path forward. But generally, you know, something, a, a something, a change of this magnitude to a pen dot road is generally going to go through. Uh, you know, a process, and they probably would be steering you towards like that multimodal uh, type program. Um, but you know, it, a municipality coming them to them, uh, you know, with the ideas of what they're trying to achieve, uh, that's probably the best. It's, it's not going to hurt to talk to your municipal services rep uh, to try and start steering down a certain path. Whether it was a duly advertised conference plan or a something else, so long as it's, you know, you say, Borough and Arvin Arbor has discussed this, we've approved this, they'll say, okay, great, but they're not going to look for details on what type of plan it was in or how it was approved exactly. Um, and what level of, like, engineering analysis would they look for? I mean, can we just do something like what Adam did, is just sort of draw something up, or do we need to have, like, Traffic engineers. It depends on what you're, what it's for. I mean, for a grant application, you probably need a little bit more than that. A little bit more than what? Than what Adam drew up. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like what I was talking about, in case PennDOT comes to you tomorrow and says, "Hey, we're going to uh, review this road. Got anything you want to say about it?" It could be something. It, they would draw. it doesn't even have to be a drawing. It could be three sentences <clears throat> that were, that, that council approved that just say, we want to reduce the partway width and plant more trees and have bike lanes if we can. The yeah. end. You know, like that. So long as it's, you can say, we discussed this, this is what we want in this, this road, like that even would be enough. So that's, a, that's more to start anyway. And then if that doesn't come to you in the near future and you want to move forward with things, yourself you try to keep going with the design as much as you can yeah i think kind of a, a detailed out like description of here what's what's our objectives we want to improve pedestrian safety we want to provide for uh you know uh bicycle facilities we want to provide for a better you know slowing traffic detail out what it is conceptual plan of like here's the theoretical ideas uh, I would recommend you probably want that vetted through, uh, you know, the traffic engineer uh, to give some input on that. Um, uh, but then that that's kind of building the basis of where you want to go. Uh, and that, that's, you know, at this point, that's probably the uh, where you want to be to communicate to PennDOT. And then that would set you up in the future to, you know, seek funding or, you know, when projects come in, that type of thing. Eric, is, is the uh, is Mike the borough traffic engineer, is he qualified to provide that vetting that you just described? Would he, he would be, yes. So maybe, maybe you've unlocked a word or a concept. Maybe what we should suggest to council is that we we think it would, should be a priority to develop a, a kind of concept for multimodal improvements 
uh, along this section of Wynwood Wynwood Avenue with mm -hmm. sort of pedestrian and, and, and bicycle movement and safety. And that we'd like them to support efforts to develop that concept plan. And that um, uh, we would like that concept plan to be, I mean, I'm not sure how much time it actually takes to do the concept plan as opposed to do the kind of navigation of things. But you know, it would be great to set a goal for you know six months to have a concept plan or faster. Um, and that we, some of the steps we envision would be, you know, inviting out the PennDOT municipal rep, holding some kind of community workshop or walkabout to get input from the community and asking Laura Marion to, to participate. It's not to say, telling them this is what we're going to do and ask them to participate. Um, I think that, is, does that sound like the kind of thing we should be asking council for at this point? To, and to ask Sam to lead it to lead the development of this concept. Does that sound like where we should be heading? Okay, is that who is that opposed to the board or me? Opposed to anyone who wants to be part of the board. I was actually thinking that Adam should present this to council. Well, yeah, I think, Same I, think, way he did I think what we do is we convey this and then ask them for an opportunity to present this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because it, it when, when you see it the way Adam, it was a beautiful explanation. I think the way you that you presented it was great, and I think it makes it very clear why this is so important. I mean, I can just visualize that now and how it will slow traffic down. We wanted to put a, a circle at the tunnel, and right. that got shot down. Um, uh, and they put up a traffic light, which was a huge mistake, I think, because it just encourages speeding uh, through there and potentially dangerous crossing for pedestrians. Um, to council, though, I think there's a probably an intermediate step because there is an infrastructure committee. We okay. probably need that needs to be the first step. That's why I gave Fred Bush a heads up about this. Okay. So what we ought to do is ask if Fred like either informal presentation or whether he'd like to have a presentation at the infrastructure committee. The thing is, once we get the council run, we have to let council kind of be a partner in how we navigate. And our first partner is going to be Fred Bush, because um, he's the chair of the infrastructure committee. And being a regular member at the infrastructure meeting, he's probably the venue where you would, the council would be directing you uh, for you know such a topic. Here's comments first. Is that feasible or? You mean the, the traffic, traffic engineer's engineer? comments on this? Yeah, sorry, the tra borough traffic engineer. Yeah. Well, just like basically to, I mean, if we work backwards from the, it was, as Chloe said, this list of things that we're trying to do, right? We want to have safe pedestrian crossings. We want to, you know, all of those items. And then uh, I, I just would save some time if the traffic engineer was already briefed and ready. Um, I, I mean, I believe we just have to ask. I think, yeah. Uh, ask Sam if that's all right. Um, um, but I don't see why that would be a problem. So, uh, Eric, who else is on the infrastructure committee? Do you know offhand? Uh, it's Fred. Um, oh, why put me on the spot? Uh, and. That's great. Okay. Fred and Michelle, the two of them. Michelle, yeah. yeah. And. Is it Rob? Rob. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, Rob, Rob, Michelle. Okay, well, they both live on the south side, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Michelle's super well, interested. Politics is local. And Rob's the head of our, you know, not the head, but the champion for green issues. So, um. Yeah. Let's 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 make a kind of resolution that, that ultimately our, our, our goal is to get council to endorse a concept for multi modal improvements to Mammoth Red. And then they would ask the infrastructure committee to discuss that. That we'd like to present ideas to the infrastructure committee, that we would like to support the road manager, and we'd like to be able to vet some ideas we have already with the road traffic engineer. Mm -hmm. Sounds um, good. Is that something like you, Adam, does that sound like you? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, OK, 
Does everyone, is that a resolution we can vote on? Yeah. I can write it up and send it off. Perfect. Anyone have any amendments to that, clarifications, or it's all in favor? Aye. 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 Let's go to the motion to stop. Okay. Okay, good. Um, and now Adam will keep us on track. Um, okay, so I think that because it's 9.20, we should just uh, set aside our other topics for a future meeting. When? Just one quick question. So this will go to Infrastructure Committee, but will we still be involved in the evolution of this project? Or uh, I, That's a good question. I, you know, Sam seemed very interested in leading the charge on this. Okay. So, um, um, uh, I guess that's a good question for you all. I mean, what role do you see the planning commission as a group as opposed to individual planning? I mean, uh, do you feel we have the, the kind of capacity to be the host for this? If council wants us to? It's a question. I mean, for green practices, I would advocate for it. I would, you know, be, I'm not sure that we need to be involved in it. I think we need to kind of be involved, at least as individuals. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, probably Sam would want to put together a little group to kind of I mean, I'd certainly speak for it. Um, or, uh, Adam, what are you thinking? Do you have I'm still learning the process. It just seems to me that council, if they needed the planning commission, would ask the planning commission, right? Yes. And well, sometimes, and sometimes we tell them what they need. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> back and forth. It's a healthy conversation. Well, and it's lower variant too. I mean, you know, it's. Um, but uh, yeah. I, I think I think that I think that um, we have a couple of conduits there. I'm not sure who Sam communicates with. Um, Canoni's team also works with Lower Marion. I talked to Chris, the, the politicians talk. I think the conversation needs to knit together at all those levels. Um, but ultimately we need councils and premature on this, and so we'll, we'll need them to kind of help us right. figure that right. out. Um, okay, so what I was, what I was gonna say is, um, it's not 20, we should uh, move on. I wanted to say that next month, our, first of all, next month our meeting is not the first Monday because it's Labor Day, and we agreed because of certain other uh, conflicts, primarily the Jewish holidays, we decided to have our meeting on September 13th, Monday, September 13th. So all of you who are tuned in, I want to remind you of that date that we scheduled. Um, I also know that if the schedule holds, it is likely we'll see 146 Marion. Um, so between now and that meeting, I'd like our little groups to really work hard on the infill zoning. We have to we'll probably need to have a meeting with the 146 Marion people, like an administrative meeting, kind of uh, talk about their application. Um, so I think we need to really focus on moving that work along. We also may have three Elmwood according to the schedule that three Elmwood. Essentially, they are going to continue working on their application to try to address, even though we wouldn't know, they're going to keep working on it and to try to address the concerns they heard. And so it's possible to come back with a new application. And but so, a totally new application. I don't know what they'll come back with. I really don't know. Whether, I wish. I don't know what they'll come back with, but they want to keep working on it. Right? Um, and council gave them the extension to keep working on it. And so they may make a new submission. Uh, it may come to us in September. I, I'm, I'm just saying, be prepared. We may have some hefty things to work on. Wouldn't it have to be a new submission? Because we already voted that one down. We, we only recommend the council, council grant an extension. And what is a new submission and what's not is up to the solicitor, really, to decide. So, I, I don't. But even though we voted to recommend that the application be rejected, council voted to uh, accept their request for an extension. So it's still an active application. And so as an active application, it may come back to us, and it may come back in September. Um, so anyway, we may have hefty things in September. And so what I'm really trying to get at is if we want to, if we have those on our agenda, 
and we learn this and these other things along, we may need to be prepared to have another meeting. Which brings me to the last thing, as I sent you all a note asking whether we should consider having a meeting a month to deal with applications and a meeting a month to deal with long-term planning. We don't need to decide that now, but I would ask you to think about that. And whether, and whether to kind of spread the workload, we should actually have co-chairs, one chair for current applications and one chair for long-term projects to kind of split the workload. This is not unusual. Um, we've never really talked about it before because we've never had this, this workload. Um, I will tell you I am personally totally exhausted. Um, but I think that it's a good kind of exhaustion because, well, we have the attention of the community, we have the attention of the council, the work is very respected, it's listened to, it's valued. So Dave will tell you how many years was the planning commission in the wilderness. Um, and we're not anyone, so that's a good thing, but it also means that there's a lot on our plate. So I ask you to consider that. If you have private thoughts about that, let me know. We can continue talking about it in future meetings, but um, it may make sense. So with that, um, I don't see any members of the public left, so I don't think there's a need for public comment. Do you, does anyone else have any comments or things you'd like to bring up or talk about before we adjourn? Okay. All right, then. So we'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Oh, that was a second. You Okay. Okay.